Hello, this is Dr. Kevin Kirby coming to you again from Northern California. Today's lecture is again going to be on more biomechanics terminology. And today we're going to be discussing elastic and plastic deformation, Young's modulus, and elastic strain energy. Let's look at some of the terminology that I've reviewed in my previous lectures. The first one is stress. As we said before, stress is the ability of an object to develop an internal resistance force to external loading forces. So when we have a tension stress, we have a, possibly a force pulling apart this object over a certain cross-sectional area, and the stress is going to be a force divided by its cross-sectional area. So stress is measured F over A, A being cross-sectional area, and again, it's measured in Pascal's. Strain, however, is a dimensionless quantity which indicates the amount of elongation or compression or change in shape an object undergoes when subjected to an external force. Strain is going to be measured as the change in length versus its original length. And here we have a no force acting on a bar. A large force is applied to this bar. The bar increases in length, so the strain is going to be the change in length in this bar versus its original length. And again, it's going to be a dimensionless quantity. In the world of biomechanics, we use a machine called a materials testing machine in order to subject tendons, ligaments, bone, cartilage, skin to either compression or uh, tension or even torsional loading forces in order to determine their mechanical characteristics. When we put this materials testing machine and, and clamp a piece of tendon in this materials testing machine and we then stretch it and we measure the force and the amount of stretch this occurs, we will end up with what's called a stress strain curve. Stress is going to be on the y-axis it is the force over the cross sectional area of the material. Strain is going to be the change in length. So when we put this tendon and we initially start to pull on it, it gets this toe region. And the toe region occurs because of the crimp in the collagen fibers in this tendon or ligament. And then we get into this elastic region or linear region, also, also called the Hookian region for Robert Hooke, who invented the law of springs. Uh, this linear region or elastic region is the region where we can load up this tendon or ligament and then unload it and it will return back to its original shape. However, when we take that same tendon or ligament and load it up too much, it's going to partially tear or even completely tear or completely rupture, and that is what we would call a plastic deformation. So these points on the stress-strain curve that we see are actually caused by changes in the molecular structure of the material, changes in macro and micro structure that then will change its stress strain behavior in this materials testing machine. So what exactly does it mean to have an elastic deformation? An elastic deformation could be uh, a rubber band that we stretch and then let go. It could be a bar or beam that is loaded and unloaded and it first bends and then returns its original shape. It could also be a spring that is first loaded and then unloaded and it will return back to its original shape as long as the loading force is low enough that it can remain to be elastically deformed and return to its original shape. So when we say elastic deformation, we mean these are low load uh, external forces occurring on these structures that will allow the material to absorb energy, return energy, and return back to its original shape without permanent deformation or change in structure. Plastic deformation is quite different and then the plastic deformation occurs when there is an external force applied to an object and that object then permanently deforms. Here we have a putty that is being formed plastically. It is changing shape depending on the amount of external load. And here we have a individual who is bouncing around and hits the ground here very hard, suffers an Achilles tendon rupture, and that Achilles tendon rupture obviously is a plastic deformation of that Achilles tendon. It's not gonna return back to its original shape until surgery is performed or they're put in a cast and healed. Examples of plastic deformations 
in the tissues of the body could be a partial or complete rupture in the fascia, ligament or tendon as, as a tension force. We can have shearing forces and, uh, and other types of forces causing cartilaginous tears. We can have stress reactions, stress fractures, and complete fractures of bone. We can have osteochondral injuries, such as in ankle sprains, we have osteochondral injuries that often occur at the Taylor tibial junction in the talus. And these are also classic deformations of the cartilage and bone structures of the talus, in addition to skin injuries, such as lacerations, abrasions, and even uh, types of uh, ulcerations. So when we look closely at the stress strain curve of ligament and tendon, the slope of this line in the elastic or linear region of the stress strain curve is going to be known as a stiffness. And stiffness is a more vertical uh, line here would mean that it is a stiffer material, a more horizontal line in this direction would mean it's a more compliant uh, material. Stiffness and compliance are opposite of each other. Stiffness is going to be a material that tends to be hard to deform with a certain um, force being applied to it and compliant material would deform a lot with a certain amount of force being applied to it. So as our bodies function during the day, as our ligaments stretch and our tendons stretch and our muscles contract and our, our cartilage in our joints are being loaded and unloaded, we want the, these materials to all function within the elastic or linear range of this stress strain curve and then that way they will not undergo permanent deformation and become injured so we want the, during our daily activities, to have these tissues function in this elastic range. So as I said before, when these injuries have too high loads or too high a stress, such as in that Achilles tendon rupture we saw in the video in the last few slides ago, uh, that is when the stress goes too high, we start getting a yield of that material and even a complete rupture can occur. So one of the terms that you're going to find when you do reading in the biomechanics and engineering literature regarding tissues is going to be this term of elastic or Young's modulus. Now what elastic modulus is, is the mechanical property that measures the actual stiffness of the solid material. And this was what we talked about earlier about the stiffness. So when we look at this stress strain curve again, when we look at the stress divided by the strain, that is going to be the amount of elastic modulus of that material or its stiffness. So if it has a high slope, that material is going to have a higher elastic modulus or higher stiffness. And if that material has a low slope, it's going to have a lower elastic modulus and a more compliant uh, type of uh, stress strain behavior. Elastic modulus is typically measured in Pascals with the gigapascal being the uh, unit that is commonly used to describe these tissues. It's interesting to look at a comparison of this elastic or Young's modulus in many of the body's tissues and other common uh, materials. Here's a nice graph I pulled out of a recently published paper that shows the uh, elastic modulus of materials ranging from mucus, brain, fat, all the way to liver, uh, muscle, skin, gut, nerve, cartilage, ligament, tendon, and bone. And you can see as we go from a softer, more compliant material to more stiff material, we go from being soft to stiff. And we can see also in these more these other numbers that tendon, skin, cancellous bone are in the low range. Polymethylmethacrylate, which is actually used for implants, is in about the same range as cancellous bone. And there's a reason for that because uh, we want to have the implant materials to not be so much harder than the bone that we place into the bone so that the harder material breaks down the bone. Cortical bone is in the 17 gigapascal region. Aluminum is 70 and tooth enamel, which is the hardest substance in our body, is our stiffest material in our body is going to be about the same as aluminum, whereas titanium and steel are obviously much stiffer materials, much more harder to form with a given load on acting on that uh, material. When we look at some of the research that's been done over the years on the materials in our uh, foot, our biological materials in our foot, one of the earliest mentions of this stress strain curve or elastic modulus is going to be from uh, 
Wright and Reynolds from 1964. So we're talking about nearly 60 years ago. And they had a primitive uh, materials testing machine where they clamped a specimen of plantar fascia into these uh, clamps here. They placed a strain gauge into the um, on the plantar fascia so it, the deformation could be measured. And as they placed it under strain, there is more stress. And we can see this curve is that as we load up that plantar fascia, it becomes more and more stiff. The curve goes upwards, upwards, upwards as we uh, put more strain on it or elongate it more. And this is some of one of the earliest uh, papers within the literature that talks about measuring ligamentous or fascial uh, strength or stiffness in the medical literature. Uh, one other topic that I want to just briefly cover, and this would require a whole lecture in itself, but this topic of strain energy is very important when we start talking about how energy is stored or returned during walking, but specifically during running and jumping activities. Strain energy is such that materials, including uh, balls, uh, tendons, ligaments, rubber bands, etc., during deformation, when they're deformed, they will store a form of potential energy called elastic strain energy. And in this example of a ball that's dropped from a shelf, it has 100% potential energy at the top of the shelf because it has a certain height above the ground. As gravity accelerates it toward the ground, it picks up kinetic energy to the point just before it hits the ground, it has 100% kinetic energy. Then the ball will compress, storing what we call the elastic strain energy. And then that's a potential energy, again, that then will, once that ball rebounds into its normal shape, it will actually accelerate the ball upwards, again, putting potential energy into kinetic energy. And this is how bouncing balls will continue bouncing, is they're exchanging potential and kinetic energy with each bounce and each rise and fall from the ground. And so we want, if we have a purely elastic material, which there is not uh, such a material, the ball would be able to continue bouncing and bouncing without uh, losing height with each bounce. Well, some of the members of the animal kingdom, especially kangaroos and wallabies, are very good at storing and releasing kinetic energy. And this is a uh, video of a kangaroo that is, is jumping where it's actually research has shown that wallabies and kangaroos can store a significant amount of, the, of their energy for locomotion when they're hopping in the long tendons of their body by first stretching and storing elastic strain energy as a potential energy and then releasing that as kinetic energy, which then will allow the animal to actually save energy when it is hopping or locomoting in its, a very specific way. In the human, we also can store strain energy. Here is a video I've done and is on the internet on abductory twist. And here we see the uh, subject, uh, same subject that's walking here. I'm taking their leg and I'm internally rotating it while they're relaxed. And you can see how it snaps back. Well, that's elastic strain energy within the hip and knee ligaments and muscles. While I'm stretching it, it then snaps back. And that's a first a storage of strain energy and then a release of kinetic energy. And we see the same thing happening in this abductor twist where we see this snapping of the heel medially uh, at the end of mid stance phase of gait where the heel lifts off. This again is another type of strain, elastic strain energy that occurs within the human body during its locomotor activities. So in summary, these elastic deformations of the bodies that occur with each step, with each activity we do occur thousands of times a day. They're normal and they will occur without any injury to the tissues of our body. However, if we have high loads, high stresses, we will get at the other end of that stress strain curve where plastic deformations occur, whether that's a ligament tear, uh, a tendon complete rupture, a stress reaction or stress fracture or a complete fracture of bone or a cartilage tear or a skin injury. And these plastic deformations are the type of uh, injury producing uh, tissue injuries that will bring patients into our office with injuries to their uh, foot and lower extremity, whether they're plantar fasciitis or posterior tibial tendonitis, Achilles tendon injuries, or fractures or other types of injuries to their foot and lower extremity. 
you have to understand that this elastic modulus is important because many of the body's tissues have a different elastic modulus. In other words, they will react differently to different loads. They, some tissues were to form more than other tissues under a given loading force so that some tissues are stiff, such as bone and tooth, whereas other tissues are less stiff, such as uh, ligaments and especially uh, soft structures such as the organs within our body, in addition to fat and um, other types of more compliant materials. And finally, this concept of elastic strain energy uses this concept where elasticity within the uh, in an object, and specifically for uh, animals and humans, the elasticity within the muscles, the tendons, and the ligaments of the uh, foot and lower extremity can be used to store and release uh, strain energy, uh, converting potential energy to kinetic energy to make running, jumping activities more energy efficient for the human locomotor system. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture and enjoying this series of lecture I'm giving, and I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. Goodbye.